So good afternoon, everybody out here on the East Coast. Good morning to anybody else that's joining us in other time zones. Um, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today uh, in this webinar series. So this is going to be our actual second presentation of the day on scale insects. And so this, of course, kicks off our uh, scale week or our first day of scale week. Um, so real quick, my name is Patrick Anderson. I'm an arborologist here with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Uh, with us today also helping to answer questions and work with technology is gonna be Allison Harrell, who's also an arborologist. She's out in uh, Portland, uh, Oregon. I'm here in outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, some quick housekeeping slides. So one is, if you have any questions throughout the course of the webinar, please put them into that question and answer box. You have kind of a, a chat box option and a uh, question and answer box option. Work, on, work in the question and answer box option. You can chat in the chat if you want, but we're going to answer questions that are in the Q&A. Uh, it makes it a lot easier on us. Um, likewise, this webinar is good for one ISA CEU. So with that being said, um, if you did not put your ISA CEU in when you, or your number in when you registered, put that in the Q&A box. So again, if you did not put in your ISA CEU number when you registered for the webinar, put that into the question and answer box, not in the chat. Stuff gets lost in the chat. We can track it really easy in the question and answer box. So make sure that happens. Um, this is going to be um, good for, uh, some pesticide applicator credits. We don't have all of those um, uh, locked in yet. I'm still working through the state pesticide applicator credit um, process. That being said, at the end of the webinar, we will be posting a link into the chat box. So this will come at the conclusion of the webinar into the chat box. There'll be a link there. Um, where you can fill out your uh, state pesticide applicators credits. And if we're able to attain them, we'll make sure you get those. So any questions there, um, feel free to ask throughout the course of the, the conversation. And with just a little bit here of ado, we're gonna introduce uh, Dr. Richard Coles, who we're very happy to have here today. Uh, Dr. Coles is, is a great speaker, knows a lot about uh, this subject, and we're really honored to have him here today. So he's a scientist with the Valley Laboratory uh, at the, the, excuse me, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, Dr. Coles has been working at the Valley Lab um, for the past 26 years. Um, and what he endeavors to do is find the most environmentally conscious and economical method, an effective method to manage um, insects, mites, and diseases of trees uh, in, or, and also in shrubs, turf, and, and small fruit crops. Uh, and he has a special interest in managing pest Christmas trees, uh, including armored scales, as we're going to talk today, and phytophthora root rot, which maybe we'll have him come back and talk about on another day. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop my share. I'm going to turn it over to you, um, Dr. Cole. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And I'll see you here in a little while. Okay. Gee, I have the presentation for Phytophthora root rot here, too. But I guess I'll choose the one on the armored scales. <laughs> okay. Share. And start the presentation. I hope the share has the, the audio. Just a moment now. Let me go back here. Meeting controls. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Um, so all I, have kinda... do, all I have to do is start the slideshow then. And you can let me know if you can hear it fine. Will do. I'd like to thank Rainbow Tree Care. We for have audio. Me today Excellent. about uh, biology and management of armored scales, which will include um, some of my research on this subject. This gives you a little bit of, a, of an overview for my presentation. I'll be introducing you to the biology of armored scales, go over uh, just a few of the species that are commonly found in the landscape, uh, talk about the things that eat scales, uh, and then talk about both chemical control and practices. Uh, it looks like when you mute yourself, um, it mutes the, uh, the presentation. I'm sorry about that. I had no idea. I was just not going to make it less, um, <laughs> less distracting to have 
Okay, not a problem. We need to change to manage. There we go. Skills. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Armored scales are really a, a unique group uh, to talk about in terms of insect pests on landscape plants. They're in the order Hemiptera, which means that they have uh, sucking mouth parts. But unlike other species of Hemiptera, they do not produce honeydew. They don't tap directly into the vascular system, xylem or phloem, of the plants to feed. They feed directly on plant cells within within their hosts. The other thing that's unusual about them is that they secrete a scale cover that's not attached to their body. Unlike the soft or felt scales in which the, the cover is part of their body, the scale cover is not part of the body for the armored scale. Uh, another really weird thing about their biology is that the gut does not continuously go from the mouth parts to the anus. It simply dead ends somewhere in the insect. And the anus has additional functions for producing a cement that's used for making the cover and also for emitting uh, sex attractive pheromones. The males and females of armored scales look very different from each other. The crawler straight stage is an incredibly important uh, part of the life cycle of these armored scales. It's the only stage that can move from where the sedentary uh, female has been feeding to some new part of the plant or to some new plant. Um, so uh, on the right hand side, you see an elongate hemlock scale that has been flipped over. So we're looking at the underside of the scale. And we can observe, uh, first of all, the old shed skin from the second instar. And then we can see the female scale body through the uh, scale covering here. And then a row of eggs, actually a double row. There's eggs on one side and on the other under, underneath this, the scale uh, covering here. And there's a flap that will open up to allow the scale crawlers that have hatched a way to exit from underneath the mother scales cover. Uh, one of the curious things about scale crawlers, and here we see a scale crawler with uh, two eye spots, two antennae. You can't see the legs that are underneath. But on a conifer, all the scales that I've studied will actually slit the cuticle of the needle and will slide themselves underneath. So to some extent, they're feeding within the plant itself. But the important thing is that they, they are the only stage that can disperse. So they can crawl to a new area on the plant. They can blow about in the wind, like almost like pollen, or they can be hitchhiking on other insects or perhaps on birds. This diagram shows the life cycle of the armored scale starting out from the crawler stage or first instar nymph they would um, settle on the plant start to feed after they have fed for a while they'll molt into the second instar nymph and from that point they either develop into a female or a male if they develop into the female they will molt one more time and continue to feed and of course uh, grow after that last molt into the stage that would be mating and then producing eggs. If they develop into a male, the molt from the second instar nymph does not have functional mouth parts. And so this stage is called a prepupa or third instar, which then will molt yet once again to form the pupa or the fourth instar and then finally emerge as the adult male. So this life cycle on this side of, of, of the figure is rather like what we see in thrips. Here's an example of an adult male and a female for which I have removed the scale cover. So you can see here. 
You may remember in introductory entomology that insects have three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. But when it comes to scales, that's not so clear. Basically, the head, thorax, and abdomen are all fused into one amorphous mass. And so um, in this illustration, you see the upper half and the lower half uh, of, of the body. You have to imagine this part being reflected over to this side to show the complete view of the upper surface of the body. And um, it shows you that there's not a whole lot to look at in terms of external morphology of a scale insect. There's a very tiny eye, very tiny antenna. And then there's this part of the body called the pygidium, which contains the really important uh, parts, the anal opening and the vulva. This is a picture of a female scale. And the pygidium is important because from these various glands is secreted wax, which is mixed with the cement through the anal opening, and then shaped like by these parts, which act like little trowels to, to shape the scale covering. So the scale is moving about underneath the scale cover and using this structure, the pygidium at the hind end of its body, to form the scale cover around it. The male scale is really distinctive. Um, it does not have functioning mouth parts. It has four compound eyes. You can see the two eyes on one side here. Very long antennae, which are used to detect sex pheromone produced by a female scale. One pair of wings, and most importantly for it, it has its external genitalia, which are used to reach underneath the flap where the crawlers would emerge on, for a female scale. It reaches underneath that flap to be able to inseminate the female scale. A very important part of their biology is that the male scales are haploid. They have only one set of chromosomes, whereas the females are diploid. That means that the female is able to determine the sex of her offspring by whether she fertilizes the egg or not. There are two large groups uh, within the armored scales <coughs> represented on this slide. There's the elongate forms of scales, diaspidine group, which has the old uh, scale covers from previous nymphs held at one side of the body. And then there are the aspidiotine subfamily of scales that are circular in shape, in which the old, sh old scale covers are present in the center of the scale body. A really convenient short reference on the subject is available from University of Maryland Cooperative Extension, scale commonly encountered in Maryland landscapes and nurseries. It not only has good color photographs of our common armored scales, but includes felt scales and soft scales, and has a good guide showing when the crawler activities would be, uh, when the crawler activity would be taking place for each of these species. Another extraordinary resource is something called ScaleNet. It's a web-based guide to the uh, scales of all sorts. It has a catalog of species, their common names, ecology, geographical range, and a, a list of scientific references. The reason why we're interested in scale insects is because they can be so damaging to landscape shrubs and trees. The reason for this is their, their feeding, in which as they feed, they are producing waste products and toxic saliva that they inject into the plant as they feed. So for example, on the right, there were cryptomeria scales on the underside of this needle that caused this chlorosis. Those needles may fall from the fir tree. And in this case, the euonymus scale feeding both on the leaves and on the stems can be killing parenchyma tissue as they're feeding 
uh, which might girdle the stems, or it can cause uh, chlorosis in the leaves and the leaves drop off, thereby starving that branch of additional photosynthase. I'll give you a little bit of a cast of characters here in some of the most common species that we encounter in the landscape. The one for which I probably have the most calls would be Pernicola scale. Uh, Pseudolocaspis pernicola is found in temperate zone areas. Further south in the country, there's also a white peach scale, very closely related, very similar looking. They'd be hard to distinguish one from the other. There are two generations per year of the scale. Uh, there are, all of the prunus species are attacked. They feed on the bark. And when you get very high populations, uh, the uh, scales will turn the entire surface of, this, of the bark white. There can be multiple layers of scales. Scales may settle underneath the mother scales cover, and so you'll have layer upon layer of, of scales on the bark surface. Not only prunus are attacked, but there are 14 other plant families can be hosts. These scales overwinter as adult females. The Prunicola scale was a good example of one of these circular scale types of, of species. The oyster shell scale is a good example of a diaspitine uh, scale in that it's elongated and has this old scale covers off to one side, as in this picture. Here again, there's a first stage, first instar scale cover second in star scale cover, adult cover. Here are newly settled crawlers. There's one generation per year of the oyster shell scale. They are commonly found on lilacs, elms, apples. They feed on the bark of the plants. They have very thick scale covers, and so that can make them very difficult to control with products like horticultural oil. There are 73 plant families that can be hosts, so they have a very broad host range. And then they also overwinter as adult female. Euonymus scale is one of the very common uh, complaints that come to my attention. Very, very high populations of, of scales present in, in this picture on a Euonymus on the bark of the tree and obvious uh, uh, shrub, and obviously they'll feed on foliage as well. One of the curious things about the haplodiploid system for sex determination in scales is that the females can determine the sex of her offspring at the time the eggs are laid. If it's a fertilized egg, it will become a female. If it's unfertilized, it will become a male. So sometimes with these scales, you'll see under crowded conditions, the females will produce almost exclusively male offspring. And um, obviously here the males are very distinctively different looking from the females. Here's a female, here's a male. And there are three grooves in this waxy covering of the scale cover uh, for the male nymphs. There are two generations per year. Mostly I hear about it on Euonymus on foliage or bark, but there are 20 other plant families that can be hosts for this particular scale. San Jose scale has been in this country for a long time, since the 1800s. In fact, that's reflected by the name Comstock Aspis, <coughs> named after John Henry Comstock, the founder of the entomology department at Cornell University. Uh, this is another one of the circular type scales, and you can see the very distinctive uh, contrasting color of the uh, white cap of the nymph that's just settled, and then you have a dark surrounding scale test, and then around that even contrasting a lighter gray color. This scale will feed on um, bark, leaves, or fruit, and unlike the other scales in this presentation, this has three generations per year, and where most of the armored scales only lay, let's say, 
30 to 50 eggs underneath the scale cover. This scale is famous for, for laying um, some hundreds of eggs. And so they have a tremendous reproductive potential. When the scales settle on the apples, this is an unfortunate blemish on the apple fruit that will be visible at the time that fruit are harvested. There are 41 other plant families besides the rosaceae that can be hosts. Elongate hemlock scale is obviously one of the diaspidine scales, you know, one of the long scales with the shed, shed scale cover um, off to one side. You can see the sexual dimorphism here in the female scale is long and, and brown. And then the male scale has a white cover. The male scales also will produce a lot of waxy filaments that will discolor the foliage uh, surrounding where there's a heavy scale infestation. One of the curious things about elongate hemlock scale is uh, it's quite unusual in that they have a membrane that en encloses the scale on the underside of the scale uh, as, as well as the scale cover on the top. That's called pupillarial uh, condition. And this elongate hemlock scale was flipped over, so you're looking at the underside of the scale. The cryptomeria scale is one of these circular sorts of scales. It's a very, um, has a very translucent scale cover. You can see the yellow nipple or the um, old scale cover right in the center of the scale. And you can look right through the scale cover to see the female scale underneath. We have um, a lot of problems with this scale in Christmas tree plantations or landscape plantings of uh, true firs. Um, the populations can build up very rapidly to the point where there's essentially standing room only populations of scales on the undersides of the needles. Now it's been said that nature abhors a vacuum and when you have large populations of insects feeding on plants there ought to at least be something feeding on them and there oftentimes is. So there are many specialized predators, parasites, and diseases of armored scales that would normally naturally keep them in balance in the environment. The first I'll mention is the twice stabbed lady beetle or Chilocra species. They're very distinctive in, in being uh, good sized, uh, fairly large lady beetles, black with two red spots on their back. And both the adults and their larvae uh, feed exclusively on armored scales. This is a very small predatory beetle that feeds exclusively on armored scales. It was brought in by a researcher from University of Massachusetts for control of Euonymus scale, but it will feed generally on practically any armored scale. Cybocyphilus nipponicus originated from Korea. Both the uh, adult female and male and also the larva will feed on scales. The larva is hard to observe in the field as, the, as it's a very tiny insect and tends to feed underneath the scale covers, which provides it some protection. It's fairly easy to find evidence of these various scale predators if they're present. Here is um, an example of where there are there has been no predation on cryptomeria scale. And you can look at this image and you can see that almost all the scales have been fed upon by predators. And the reason why I can say that is <laughs> because the scales are actually feeding underneath the waxy cuticle of the conifer needle. Every time a predator has eaten one, it leaves behind this track of where the wax has been disturbed from where the scale used to have been. There are many species of parasitic wasps 
will attack armored scales. The uh, adult wasp here in Carcia citrina will come along and lay its egg into a second instar um, female scale and she'll, she'll sting that scale insect and deposit a, an egg and then that egg will hatch into larva that consumes the scale underneath that scale cover and then when the wasp has completed development the newly emerging adult wasp will cut a circular hole a very distinctive circular hole to emerge this is a different species of parasitic wasp i've only seen on a few occasions but where it has been present it's been present in great abundance uh, this is closely related to the golden calcid which is used commercially for control of California red scale and citrus. Fungi get into the act too. Here I show three different fungi I've worked with that cause infections of, uh, in armored scales. We have so many of these generalist scale predators available and diseases and parasitoids then there has to be an explanation for why we have scale outbreaks. And much of the explanation has to do with the ecology of the predators versus the scales. And these are various possible explanations that people have, um, have arrived at. There could be a poor synchrony or timing of the development of the predator might not match the scale life cycle. There could be a disturbance in nutritional balance when we feed excessive nitrogen to the trees and shrubs. Plant stress can weaken the defenses of, of plants. For example, trees in an urban environment are much more likely to have scale populations than a similar tr tree that would be out in the forest. There may be a lack of a specialist natural enemy that would be present in the homeland for some exotic species of scale. And I think one of the most important could be the lack of uh, resources that natural enemies need. For example, nectar or pollen in the environment that they might be feeding upon. So if they're not being held in check by natural mechanisms, it falls back on us to try to use chemical control, some sort of an insecticide to keep their numbers in check. And uh, the basic strategies that have been used have been to suffocate the scales with the dormant oil spray, to use a contact insecticide to kill the crawlers when they're moving about on the plant surfaces, and that could also include horticultural oil. And lastly, because these insects are feeding on the plant with sucking mouth parts. Um, there's a lot of interest in using systemic insecticides to reach them from the inside of the plant. Now, I always used to think of oil as the go-to material for management of armored scales, but there are a number of reasons why it's sometimes um, a little less than satisfactory. One of the problems can be that it's difficult to get good spray coverage. For example, here we're looking at a, a shoot on a Fraser fir, and um, the scales are feeding on the undersides of these needles. In a Christmas tree, there's very dense foliage, and so it's practically impossible to suffocate the scales on the undersides of needles through the entire tree. The second a uh, problem can be potential phytotoxicity with horticultural oil. In this case, the tree was sprayed just as the buds were starting to break, and you can see that the tips of some of the needles are, have turned yellow. And this can be a problem with uh, certain species of trees. Uh, for example, uh, Douglas fir is very sensitive to oil. You'll turn the whole tree yellow and a few other species of, of trees are sensitive to oil as well. The problem is that we need to have contact of the oil with the scale. 
And there are a number of reasons why this won't take place really adequately. Uh, for one thing, on a conifer, they're under the cuticle of the needle, so there's yet one additional layer of protection. Uh, certainly, for certain species of uh, scales, they have thick scale covers, such as the um, oyster shell scale. Another thing to think is about is that they're not directly connected to the scale cover. And so there is a, a certain amount of air that's between the scale cover and the scale body. And you can think about that as a reserve air supply. If you're actually suffocating the scale with horticultural oil, that can lead to some inadequacy of this treatment. And then finally, and probably most important for certain species like uh, pernicola scale, is that there are multiple layers of scale covers Scales will settle underneath a mother scales cover, and that can happen for several generations. And so it's nearly impossible to get the horticultural oil to reach the living scale to suffocate it. On the other hand, horticultural oil has some really great benefits for scale management. For one thing, since it has no residual toxicity, once you have sprayed the oil, the only natural enemies that you're going to be hurting are those that were killed at the time of spraying. And so once the spray is done, those natural enemies will have a chance to move about on the plant surface and do their job for you. This additional consideration is that there's unlikely to be variation in susceptibility to suffocation. And so scales should not be able to evolve resistance. This is somewhat controversial. Um, maybe they could evolve thicker scale covers. But in any case, I, I'm not sure that there's ever been any case of insecticide resistance to horticultural oil among insects. Now, if you're not able to get good contact of the horticultural oil because there are multiple layers of scales present, now, one of the things you can do is to physically remove the scale population either by using uh, some sort of a, a scrubber or a scrub brush or possibly even a uh, high pressure washer set up not to damage the, the, the plant. But you can remove, physically remove scale sufficiently then to get much better contact between the horticultural oil and the scale population. Crawler sprays are one of the principal ways in which we can manage armored scales. Recognizing that they might be difficult to kill from underneath the, the scale cover when they have a cover, the crawler is really the only stage that's not protected by this cover. Furthermore, most of the scale crawlers will come out from underneath the mother scale's cover and will be crawling about on the plant surfaces. So if we have a residual insecticide, contact insecticide, uh, then the, the scale crawlers will dose themselves as they're moving about on the plant. If you need to time the spray for targeting scale crawlers, then uh, one useful tool is to set up crawler traps. And I use black electrical tape wrapped first so that the sticky side is inside, so it sticks to the branch then double it back and wrap it very tightly so that the sticky side is then facing out and leave a little handle where you can then unwrap the crawler tap, trap later. Remember to leave some colored flagging on that branch so you can find that crawler trap when you come back to visit it. One way to make the um, trap work a little bit longer is to use some Vaseline to coat the, the, the surface and then the crawlers will be stuck onto the trap. You unwrap the crawler trap to observe the contrasting color of the tiny little crawlers that might have gotten stuck onto that surface. Another way that you can time a crawler spray is by physically observing when the, crawl, when the adult scales are producing eggs and to watch very carefully for the development of eggs to suggest when those eggs are going to be hatching. This can be done either with a hand loop, a very traditional approach, uh, 
or now there's very inexpensively available USB uh, microscopes uh, that can be, they're portable, you can take them right out to the field. And I think that the another advantage of these is that you can take pictures of what you're looking at and also share those images with experts to, to get their advice. One of the challenges with the old-fashioned insecticides that were used to target crawlers are that they're broad spectrum and long residual products. Um, some examples of this would be bifenthrin or other pyrethroids, carbaryl or seven, and uh, certain of the neonicotinoids, but not imidacloprid, which really does not have good activity against this family of scales. The problem with this class of insecticides is that they're very potent against the natural enemies of the same scales you're trying to control. So they're, what happens is chemical exclusion of the natural enemies and then eventual pest resurgence. The same pest that you're trying to control, the armored scales, ends up building up to even higher populations than if you had never sprayed. And so the message here is that without having a systemic activity, you're never going to be able to contact those scales that settle under the mother scales cover. And so going in with a purely contact acting material to target scale crawlers is never going to be completely satisfactory. The sheer population size of some of these scale insects can be a grave concern because when we try to control them with uh, chemical insecticides, I think it's uh, kind of foolhardy. Their numbers are so large that it practically guarantees that there will be individuals in the population that will carry genes that will allow them to survive, especially considering that the males are haploid, which means that their every trait is expressed as a, a dominant trait. There's nothing hidden by recessive traits in the males. And so that's a very efficient way for scales to be able to uh, adapt quickly to the environment, including the use of various insecticides. The opportunity to use systemic insecticides to control scales is really quite remarkable. If you look at the list that I've provided to you, we have five truly systemic insecticides that can be presented through the, the vascular system, move throughout the plant, and be presented to the scale as it feeds on the plant tissues. And then there's one translaminar um, insecticide that's absorbed through the foliage uh, that could also be useful. And this is talking about six different modes of action available to us to target control of armored scales. I've shown through my research that Dinotefuran, or uh, Safari in this experiment, but also sold by Rainbow Tree Care as, as Transtech, is very efficient uh, for control of armored scales when sprayed as a basal bark spray. The really remarkable thing about this and other systemic insecticides is that they can be sprayed to the outside of the bark and translocated, uh, moved through the phloem, past the cambium layer, and reach the xylem, whereby they're then translocated upwards and presented throughout the, the plant uh, from the inside uh, through the foliage to where a feeding insect can be affected. Uh, the reason for, for this image is to show what I was able to demonstrate in the field is that the amount of insecticide required to control the scale population depended not only on the dosage of the insecticide, but was highly influenced by the size of the tree. Basically, the larger the tree, the larger the dosage required to kill the scales feeding on those trees. There are a number of problems, though, in relying upon insecticides like dinotefuran to control armored scales. And I, I have listed those problems here. Foremost, our concern being toxicity to pollinators, but also, of course, um, 
toxicity of the same in those insecticides to natural enemies of scales. The neonicotinoids that might be considered for managing armored scales are the ones listed in red here. That's dinotefuran, clothionidin, and thymethoxam. Those happen to be nitroguanidine neonicotinoids, which are extremely highly toxic to um, honeybees. We've conducted a lot of research on the subject of movement of pesticides into pollen or nectar at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. What I'm showing here are pollen pellets that were collected from honeybees that were housed in colonies located right at a cooperating nursery. And each one of those different colored pellets is representative of pollen that was collected from one type of flower. Honeybees have what's called flower constancy, and so they're only collecting pollen from, from one type of plant. My collaborators on this project were Kim Stoner and Brian Eitzer. Brian Eitzer is an analytical chemist. We took that pollen back to the laboratory and sorted it by color, and then Brian analyzed the samples to determine what the pesticide residues were for any pesticides found in those pollen samples. And the bottom line here is that spirea and probably any other rosaceous plant will readily transport neonicotinoids into nectar and pollen. The neonicotinoids applied to woody plants can be held over for more than one year as well. So when you think about the greatest need for controlling armored scales on plants such as uh, would be affected by white pernicola scale, duanina scale, or San Jose scale, there are a lot of rosaceous plants in that list. And yet those plants that have bloom that are attracted to bees could then pose a risk via exposure through nectar and pollen to these systemic insecticides. As practitioners, we need to be responsible and recognize that nitroguanidine neonicotinoids, like dinotefuran or safari or transtect, really should not be applied to plants that are high nectar producers or are really highly attractive to pollinators. The other uh, precaution here is that when you do soil drenches with these insecticides, that will result in higher residues in pollen or nectar than with a foliar spray application. And then finally, uh, residues in woody plants uh, will always be present in nectar or pollen for at least one year following treatment. So um, there's not just one year of risk potential risk to pollinators, and applying these systemic insecticides immediately after bloom is no guarantee that that insecticide won't be presented in excessive concentration to pollinators the next time that plant comes into bloom. Having those concerns in mind has guided my research efforts to try to find alternatives to using dinotefuran for managing armored scales. With that in mind, I, I conducted a spray trial in 2020 using various insecticides applied as foliar sprays uh, as, as crawler treatments to try to kill crawlers before they settled. And I did the experiment in a Christmas tree plantation that was infested with elongate hemlock scale. Christmas trees make a really great um, place to do this kind of an experiment because you have a, a planting with lots of trees, they're all infested, and so each tree can make an experimental unit. It's, it's very easy to replicate experiments um, in this kind of a setting. What I did is that I, I sprayed a, a spray volume of 70 gallons per acre with a backpack mist blower sprayer. And because I was targeting crawlers, I wanted to um, try to intercept as, as much of the period of crawler activity as possible. So I applied two sprays, one on June 27th, and then the second spray on July 7th. 
Uh, these are the results from that test in which I have conveniently grouped the um, results into three bunches of treatments. Here I have one group that was completely ineffective. They're not statistically significantly different from the water check. There's one product that has relatively low activity, and the remaining materials have good insecticidal activity. There's some curious things about these results, though, that I'd like to share with you, one of which is that the systemic insecticide aria, flonicamid, has a very, very similar mode of action to the product, the product here, Ventigra, which is a fitopyrapin. Both of them act upon the same mechanism of um, affecting the proprioceptor used by the insect um, to know whether it has um, just contracted or relaxed its muscles involved with feeding. So that's a, a really, uh, that was a really surprising result for me to see that. The other thing that, a uh, couple other things that surprised me is that uh, azadiractin had virtually no effect. That would have been an organically acceptable, um, somewhat systemic um, material that has insect growth regulator properties as well as anti-feedant properties. I have been hoping for it to be effective. And the other one is mainspring, which is cyantronil, cyantronilipril, that is in the anthronilic diamide class of insecticides and is a new group of systemic products uh, for which obviously there's some hope that it would have been effective against armored scales. So the bottom line is for Aria, Mainspring, and Azadiractin, there's no evidence from this trial that they had any significant activity against armored scales. Movento is a curious product in that it is systemic and it's mobile in the plant both upward and downward. And it interferes with the production of fatty acids and waxes by the insect. Uh, I think that this is an insect that insecticide that will be well worth looking at further in the future because it has low toxicity to natural enemies and to pollinators. I've mentioned the mode of action to you already for Ventigra that is statistically equivalent to um, the chemical control standard Safari as well as the insect growth regulator uh, product that is only translaminar in its systemic activity, that is piraproxifen or distance. The truly outstanding material in this tri trial was Tristar, which is acetamiprid, which is, although uh, being a, a neonicotinoid insecticide, it's not in the same class as Safari and is about 1,000 to 2,000 times less toxic to honeybees than safari. So insecticides that you might want to consider would be a Tristar, which is a neonicotinoid but has lower toxicity to bees, Distance, or piraproxifen, which is an insect growth regulator, which has a long history of being shown to be IPM friendly, having relatively little impact on the biology of the various predators and parasites that are feeding on the armored scales. And then Ventigra, or Aphidopyrapin, um, is another product that is IPM friendly that ought to be considered. So distance and Ventigra should be considered alternatives to any of the neonicotinoid products for managing scales through use of these insecticides as crawler sprays. An outstanding and unanswered question that I'll have to deal with in my future research is uh, to find out whether one spray will work for managing these armored scales. I know that it's very expensive uh, to, to, to be going out and spraying a, a plant in the first place. And so if we can make one spray work as well as two sprays, then that will save a lot of effort. I think that 
Uh, one thing I'll be trying this year will be a combination of horticultural oil with some of the materials that um, were alternatives to the Dinotefuran. So Movento, Ventigra, and Distance all are candidates for combining with horticultural oil and to time the spray when there's peak crawler hatch. The reason to combine oil with these other materials, the oil is a, a really good tool to use for insecticide resistance management, as well as having a very low impact on the natural enemies. And then combining it with any one of these three products that have some degree of systemic activity should mean that there should be a, a really good combination effect. And I'd like to um, caution that the target for managing scales probably should be for selective suppression of the scale populations, meaning that we're killing scales rather than the natural enemies. And if we're able to accomplish this with a selective insecticide, then we don't need to eliminate 100% of the scale population and that over time we'll be able to tell how well one of these insecticide programs is working and how sustainable it is because if we follow that kind of a spray program uh, for a few years and look at how the scale population responds over time if the population disappears and the problem has resolved itself then we know that we found a sustainable insecticide program if, on the other hand, if we continue to use this kind of a management program and the scale populations increase over a few years, then that's an indication uh, that we haven't found a truly um, uh, selective insecticide to work in an IPM mode. In the long run, though, armored scale management is more than just choosing the right insecticide to go and have uh, an IPM program for, for keeping them in check. Uh, rather, what we might want to do is consider the other factors that are contributing to armored scale outbreaks that are really focusing more on the importance of their natural enemies. So by planting uh, companion plants around the plants that are affected by armored scales that will provide what the predators need, certain floral resources, perhaps alternate hosts for those scale predators, um, we might be able to fill in the needs for those predators and have them be much more effective for us. Furthermore, uh, we need to reduce the stress to the trees so for uh, trees or shrubs that are planted in an urban situation, having less hardscape around them could do a lot for avoiding problems with armored scales. One thing we haven't looked at yet, but I think has some promise, would be to release predators or parasitoids uh, to affect uh, biological control. Certainly the golden calcid, which is um, uh, Ephytus malinus is grown in very large numbers and is relatively inexpensive, um, can be purchased from insectaries in California. And if we can make a timely release of uh, parasitoids where we have scale outbreaks, we might be able to get uh, population suppression through biological means rather than having to apply insecticides. And then finally, um, really the target should, for us should be to use selective insecticides very infrequently, just as a minor nudge to get things back on track to keep their populations at, a, at reasonable numbers. Are there any questions for me? That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Coles. Uh, for presenting that for us. Real quick, before we take some questions, I just want to look a little bit at the management um, and what Rainbow offers. So Dr. Coles mentioned a few things. Um, one is in his research, he found that the uh, product distance was uh, effective 
And so Proxite is brand new to Rainbow. We just released at the end of last year. And that is the same active ingredient as Distance. And this is one of these products that we might consider is, um, again, maybe a little less toxic to some of the beneficial and benign insects out there. And then, of course, we have um, our TransTech products, which are Dynatefuran, which uh, we did show were very, uh, Dr. Cole showed, were very um, effective on armored scale insects in uh, several different trials, at least. Um, and these can be applied as a soil application or a lower bark spray application. And again, before we get into some questions, I do just want to also remind people that we have our brand new scale insect management guide uh, that you can download from our website or talk to your local territory manager. I just put into the chat just a moment ago, um, the form, the link that you have to click on to get your pesticide applicators credits. I put up the wrong slide at the beginning of the show. Um, this is already confirmed for one Pennsylvania pesticide applicator credit. Uh, again, if you're from another state, put in your information and we're still going to be working to, uh, to get applicator credits for you in other states. Um, and so again, fill out that form, have your application, um, number uh there and ready to put in there and we'll also put that put that information in there for you um you know again and try to get those credits and then finally of course we have a lot more webinars coming up and i do want to take some time to get to some questions so allison i'm not sure if we have some good uh questions there that we can bring up for i see um, one already I see one we already. do yeah yeah <laughs> It says that from Todd caswell it says uh, you showed good control with acetamiprid as a foliar spray have you seen similar effects as a bark spray application? And here's a great disappointment for me. I've done that experiment in Christmas trees. Um, actually, I, I looked at basal bark sprays comparing a uh, fall application and a spring application for managing uh, elongate hemlock scale and cryptomeria scale on Fraser fir. And I compared that with uh, dinotefuran uh, as a chemical control standard. And I tried any number of other systemic insecticides uh, to see whether they might perform as a basal bark spray. And there was just the slightest hint of activity uh, with acetamiprid applied as a, as a basal bark spray. Now I have to, I have to um, put some perspective on that though too. That is a, an experiment I conducted in a Christmas tree plantation. And one of the limitations of doing an experiment for practical management of armored scales in a Christmas tree plantation is that you have a per acre limit for use of any insecticide. And so you don't exceed the, the per acre limit. You have to divide that per acre limit by 1,400 and... Uh, 1,420 trees per acre. And so that, that gives you the maximum dosage that I could, could apply per tree, which is, which is a lower dosage than you would be permitted to apply to a single tree in, a, in the landscape. So um, the long story short, Dinotefuran, Transdect or Safari, has extraordinary activity so that even when you have that limitation of the amount that you can apply to an individual Christmas tree per acre, it still is effective. Whereas acetamiprid is much less so. And so um, I think that if you're treating an individual tree in the landscape, you, you may be able to reach an effective dosage with a basal bark spray, I know that it's very readily translocated in the plant from a basal bark spray. Can everybody still hear me? Yes, cool. Oh, good. There was, um, there was okay. silence at the other <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. We are coming up on our hour, so um, we'll answer these questions, but we want to kind of breeze through. So is there any risk of extending a scale population to neighboring plants during the process of scrubbing? I have a client with a heavy prunicola scale population on privet hedge. She expressed skepticism in the scrubbing method since a lot of debris floats through the air after being dislodged. Well, 
any scale that you dislodge that had already settled is not going to survive. Um, so the only the only scale that might be dislodged that could survive would be any any crawler, you know, and that's if so it's it's not likely that scrubbing is going to be dispersing scales from one plant to another. Perfect. All right. Any thoughts on the role of red pine scale in the apparent decline of red pine in many northern New England locations, Vermont, Maine, etc.? Sometimes it's found in declining stands. Sometimes it's not. Merely an occasional associate or, in your opinion, something significant enough to drive decline of mature trees where present? It's uh, the largest component in the decline of red pine uh, through, through the northeast. Another factor would be certain bark beetles as well, um, but red pine scale, Matsukakis resinosi is the number one reason for decline of red pine. They're hard to observe too. They're, they're kind of underneath the bark. So it's, it's very difficult to know that they're, they're there. For sure. Okay. Um, so a question about the rates that you had used, I think from one of your um, man, your slides for your, from your research. So oil plus Movento Vintegra slash distance. The question is rate percent of oil. And I can tell you what we recommend, but if you want to say what you used in your study and then let Patrick answer. <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't done that uh, comparison trial yet using Movento. I've done trials like that in the past with, um, thymethoxam, uh, clothiodidin, dinatefuran and imidacloprid just in combination to go after scale crawlers. And, and typically um, going after scales at any time of, of uh, during the growing season, you would be going in with either one or 2% horticultural oil, 2% if the plant is really oil tolerant. On, on conifers, you have to wait until after the new growth has hardened off somewhat before you would consider using horticultural oil or else you will cause a, a lot of yellowing of, of that growth. Um, and then the rate for the, for the other ingredient would be um, uh, simply the label rate. And so for uh, Proxite specifically, which is our um, pyroproxen product, our label uh, recommends using at least a half percent of horticultural oil um, with that. And that is really to help as really as a surfactant uh, or an adjuvant to help break up the surface tension and coat, coat the plant. What a lot of people don't realize is that horticultural oil acting as a suffocant is the term the, the rate that you can use effectively is based upon the uh, ambient temperature. So the higher the temperature, the greater the respiration of the pest. And oftentimes, if it's fairly warm conditions, even a half percent horticultural oil will have tremendous impact on spider mites, scale crawlers, what have you. Um, so you know the idea of having to go in with two percent horticultural oil. If you're going in during the summer, that, that probably really is, is too high a concentration. So 1% or even half percent really makes more sense to me at that time of year. Yep. Um, and then I'm going to tie this into this question that just came in, which was, have you seen phytotoxicity with fall oil treatments? Um, this one is specifically magnolia, but I would expand that to generally. Yes, I have. Uh, and actually, it's a, it's a very subtle thing. Um, in New England, of course, it used to be very common for people to apply horticultural oil for managing um, both hemlock woolly adelgid and armored scales on, on eastern hemlocks. And it's very common for, for folks who go fairly late in the season for a, a, an oil application. Oil will affect the physiology of the plant for a number of weeks. And so if you have a, a sudden change in temperature and frosts, you know, a couple of weeks after having applied the oil, you can see quite a bit of needle loss. So horticultural oil, you should be a little bit earlier than, than, <laughs> than later in terms of your, your timing. You don't want to be going up too late to when the, the trees are, are really trying to settle in for, for the winter cold. <laughs> 
Great. And then this is a great one to end on. Um, any difference in potency or residual action between soil drench versus bark drench on conifers, for example, hemlocks? Um, oh, that's my specialty. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, there's, there's subtle differences in um, how quickly you see treatment effects from a soil application versus a bark spray. But overall, from my, from my work, there ultimately really is not much difference between using the same amount of active ingredient applied as a basal bark spray versus a soil application. It, it may take a little bit longer for the soil application to, to be seeing the effects on the pest population, but especially in conifers, these systemic insecticides are held very well and stored within the plant tissues. And every time you see a new flush of growth, you'll see that active ingredient remobilized to that new growth. And, um, and so give it enough time, you'll see very potent effects in either application method. And as, as, as I've published, for hemlock woolly adelge, it's certainly one application typically will provide about five years of, of protection against hemlock woolly adelge. Um, not so long with the armored scale management though. Uh, typically one to two years effect for armored scale management for treatment on conifers. That's great. Thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Coles. We are uh, past time a little bit. So for everyone that, uh, hung out with us to finish up the Q and A. We really appreciate it. Uh, we had close to a hundred people on here today. So uh, very excited there. Um, everyone again, thanks again, Dr. Cole. Thanks again. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone soon and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. So should I be signing off now? Uh, yeah. I'm, well, I'm about to kick you off. So we'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>